Insane market prediction. Is this the start of a new bull market? Or are we about to see a massive crash? Stay tuned to the end to find out. Welcome to The Bean Pod. This is your place for all things stocks and crypto. From beginner tips to expert picks, use this as fuel for your investing journey. Because when you're in the know, your money will grow. This episode of The Bean Pod is sponsored by KyberSwap. KyberSwap is a DEX and DEX aggregator, which is built to facilitate all your DeFi needs in one single platform. Fast, cheap, and safe. User experience is KyberSwap's sole focus to make everyone's life better in DeFi. Welcome to the Bean Pod. This is Shane, aka the Jolly Green Investor. And this is Josh, the Nifty Investor. Today, we're gonna be making an insane prediction for where the markets are about to go. Is this the start of a new bull market? Or is it a bear market rally and we're about to see an insane crash in all equities, crypto, Bitcoin? What's gonna happen? Mm. So there's a lot that's happening right now. You know, we just saw for our fans who listen to us for the crypto side of things, we see a Bitcoin ETF. So we're seeing all of this money pouring into Bitcoin at at the moment, into crypto. In fact, the past three weeks have actually been the biggest surge of inflows into the crypto market over the past year. Yeah, it's nuts. And the S&P 500, absolutely ripping. We're seeing stocks up 300% year to date. Most of the stock market gains have been made by, you know, some of the big companies like Apple, Google, Tesla, you know, the ones that make up like the top seven. Yep. But there's a lot of lagging companies that haven't really seen much of a boost at all mm-hmm. in prices. So where are we sitting? Yeah, it's tricky because, you know, for, for basically the entire year of 2023, other than a few dips, it's been up only in both the stock market and the crypto market. Bitcoin's gone from 15K in late 2022 to 31K now. The S&P 500 has been up only large caps, mid caps, and now starting to see small cap companies go up. But when you start to look at the headlines, you know, there are obviously, there's been naysayers, there's been the bears the whole time. And, you know, the bears have gotten torched, unfortunately, this year. They've, they say, this is the end of the rally. This is the end of the rally. But the stock market keeps going up. Crypto keeps going up. And, you know, we have to pat ourselves on the back a little bit on the show. We've been bullish the entire time. We have not been bearish. But now that, you know, one, I mean, crypto, which we'll talk about crypto specifically towards the end of the episode, but, you know, there are a few resistance levels that crypto and stuff is at, but it's more about the big picture, the macroeconomic picture, which is the stock market and, and the economy. You know, everyone starts talking about recession. Inflation has been coming down quite a bit. Um, there's some interesting things we need to bring up about the jobs reports and unemployment numbers. And, you know, we've always said on this show, when you need to start to be careful, because we've started to, to teach people to come, become contrarians, right? So when everyone says, don't buy, don't buy, market's about to crash, well, then you buy. Mm. But when everyone says, we've avoided a recession, the economy's doing great, soft landing, we, we, we're out of the woods, new bull market. Well, then maybe you need to be a little careful, right? Because if they're telling you to buy, that means they want to sell to you. So what are we seeing in the headlines right now? Yeah, it's kind of, we're starting to see some of those headlines creep in that say, oh, soft landing. We maybe no recession, maybe a chance of a recession. And so now once I start to see this headlines creep in, I think maybe the end of this rally is near. That doesn't mean it's going to end this month or even next month. Yeah. But we're starting to see that bullish euphoria come back into the market, which is now when you need to start to take a little bit of a step back, I think. Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest questions on a lot of people's lips because there are so many contrarian views out there, whether it's from different influencers, whether it's from the mass media, CNBC, it's that topic of a recession. Are we going into a recession? So there's a few things to consider. Are we seeing a decline in GDP? Are we seeing a rise in unemployment? Are we seeing a decrease in consumer spending? So we did see negative GDP last year. We saw back-to-back quarters. Typically, that's what defines, right? We did see that last year. What are we seeing now? We've actually seen the past three quarters have declined 3.2, 2.6%, 2%. So we are seeing a decline in the GDP. Right. It's not negative. We are starting to, for the first time, starting to see unemployment data come in where it is now starting to rise. So we're seeing a decline in GDP. We are seeing a rise in unemployment. And there's a huge decrease in consumer spending. Mm. And, you know, not only does the data back that up, but even, you know, like a place where we live, and we can kind of see what a lot of the businesses in the area are doing. We can see, like, you know, this is typically a place where a lot of people come to visit, high tourism. Mm. We're not seeing a ton of traffic this year. We're, and we're seeing businesses have to lay off. You know, we're not, it just doesn't have that same 
pop. So you can start start to see, you can start to piece it all together and say, look, I think we are actually heading towards what po- quite possibly is a recession. For sure. No, I mean, uh, little anecdotal pieces of evidence like that where it's just observing your own surroundings, I think, you know, go, go longer than you think because most people just don't, they, they attribute it to other factors like, oh, the weather or this happened. Yeah. But, you know, uh, this is happening, I think, all over the world. And there's some interesting figures that we've, we've brought up and we've talked about. I think there was a 50% decline in Airbnb spending in top tourist areas in North America for this, th- uh, this quarter of this year compared to last quarter, uh, the same quarter of last year. Significant. And, you know, we live in a tourist town. Same thing. We're seeing, you know, there's not many people coming, not many people spending money. Um, and then when you talk about the hard numbers, the jobs reports, right? So that we, we'll try to bring up a, a chart on the, the, um, the screen for our YouTube show. It shows that the expected numbers of jobs created every month for the past 14 months have been more than they projected. So the last piece of a recession by definition is that the jobs market is to crack. But if more jobs are being created every single month, that means... There's, there's need for workers. That means businesses are still getting customers. People are yeah. spending money. But the last thing, we're starting to see signs that it's cracking. And that last sign is that finally, the last month of reporting, which just came out last week, is that there were less jobs created than anticipated. So now the job market is starting to crack. So this could be the final domino to fall, which maybe the Fed will say, look, we did our job. Inflation is now coming down. You know, it's coming down almost to around 4 3%. The jobs market is cracked. The recession's here. We've done our job. Like, that's kind of what they're trying to do. Yeah. At which point, there would have to be what I believe would be a stimulus to get the economy going again. Because what we could end up seeing, and Elon Musk alluded, alluded to, is the fact that we could see deflation. And deflation can obviously happen for a number of reasons. And it's also, like, becomes like this cyclical, vicious monster where prices start to drop because people are saving. Businesses want to get people into the door, so they have to drop prices. Mm you know, home, home prices start to drop. So all these prices can be, begin to drop and this is going to affect inflation. Inflation could almost go negative in a way. It won't happen, but inflation will drop so much. But you need inflation to show that there's actually a growth in the economy. You know, right. there, is, there is a healthy growth of 2%. But if deflation happens, then we start to go really low and that's not good for the economy either. True. So if there's a decrease in demand, what do you have to do? I think they're going to have to eventually stimulate the economy again, like they have back in 2020, Cycle, in right? 2008 for the great financial crash. They did it for in 2000, the early 2000s for the dot-com uh, bubble. Yep. They did in the 80s. They did in the 70s for the oil crisis. Right. So there has been, it seems like every 10 years, they do have to you know pump a bunch of money back into the- It's just a cycle, right? It's like stimulus, oh, we've run too hot, tightening, running too cold, stimulus, you know, it's just a never ending cycle yeah. of, of hilariousness, really. But there are some figures now that we're starting to see some of that over bullishness, over euphoria, and people that are starting to get too exposed in the stock market. There's a figure that I read the other day, it said, at the market low, the, the S&P 500 low of this current cycle, which was last October, November, um, the amount of exposure, which is like total amount of holdings that certain funds in as a percentage of normal was at 0.08th of a percentile of all daily readings, which means, you know, they're like, oh, we're going to zero cash only. Of course, at the bottom, everyone's underexposed, right? Yeah. The smart people are overexposed. <laughs> now it's at the 99th percentile. Right. So everyone's piling, as you can see, that's why all the stocks have gone back up because mm. people are buying them. So people are now overexposed and over bullish. The S&P 500 is up over 25% since that bottom in October. But as you said, how far can this bear market rally go? And, you know, as, as you, you listen to us talk, it seems like, okay, these guys are they're calling for the end. They're calling for a crash. But I don't necessarily think that's the case. And there's a great quote that some, some massive hedge fund guy said. I don't know his name. Nathan Thuft. He <laughs> said, we think that the recession or slowdown should occur in the U.S. of Q1 of next year because we think the tightening is ultimately going to have its effect not by um, avoiding the recession, just by postponing it. So right. it's postponing it. They're not canceling it. They're postponing it. And I think that's what we've been talking about for a while. Let's kick the can down the road. It's like, oh, we don't want to face it now. We don't want to face it now. And people are, have been calling for a, t- a recession in 2023 for so long that I don't think it's going to happen in 2023. Yeah. I think it'll happen early next year, 2024. I think that's when shit will really hit the fan. When guidance starts to come out, and a bit, the big companies are like, look, all right, our sales are going to decline a little bit here. What I think, like, that could bode well for maybe companies like Affirm. You know, where people want to go out and, and still buy buy now, but pay later. We, we're all such creatures of habits, but the credit card spending, the credit card debt's at an all-time high in the U.S. right now, yep. which is crazy. And people's mortgages are going up. So how can the, re- the average retail investor afford to 
to buy stocks, mm. let alone put get their uh, mortgage payments down, right? So yeah. a lot that's happening here. <clears throat> I think one thing we haven't really looked at much lately is, so the DXY. Remember how hot that topic of conversation yeah. was? It's like DXY is rising. This is the, the US dollar is rising. The US dollar is rising. That's because they kept hiking interest rates. So it was an attractive investment right. for overseas. And when that becomes an attractive investment, typically what happens to risk on assets, they tend to fall, which is why Bitcoin was going down. But there hasn't been much chatter of that lately. And, and it's, it's been slowly and it, But it's down. slowly been fall it's slowly been falling. Yeah. And if they do pause uh hiking rates, then would we not see risk assets potentially continue to to run? Yeah, so I, I agree with that hundred percent. The reason that people have stopped talking about it is because the people that were talking about it were the bears. <laughs> right? Yeah. Those are the people saying, look, the DXY is going up, everything else is going to zero, Bitcoin going to zero. Well, for the past eight to nine months, all we've seen is the DXY trickle it to it towards its death, uh, so figuratively speaking. Yeah. And Bitcoin risk assets in the stock market continue to rise and the bears have been getting torched and they're just, you know, they go into their little holes and they don't talk about it anymore. Yeah. You know, eventually we will see a reversal in that, but it just seems that even though you know, a, a lot of uh, one of the things that always happens is when when bullish sentiment and everyone gets a little bit euphoric, people tend to say, "Oh, this is the end." But the markets can stay in over euphoria and overexposure for a very long time. You know, it can go way, way into over bullishness and overexposure, way into that blow off top before the really, really the crash comes down. So when I look at everything and I, and I see, I know there's the bad signs are starting to trickle in. The, all the data to me, and it's more just data, it's sentiment, it's seeing what people are doing in the market. It just seems like we're going to have that, we're going to have to face judgment day, but I think we have longer left. There's the, the credit card, the consumer debt that's going to come to, that's going to come to head for sure. Um, the jobs market will break. They may raise a little bit more, but it just seems that we have possibly another three to six months of bullishness before things really start to turn. Yeah, that's kind of what my prediction is too, is for, it's for next year where we start to see the rate, the actual rate cuts perhaps. Yep. And, historically speaking the day the day the days after the rate cut are actually when we see the biggest decline in the stock market right 50 percent drawdowns which is pretty substantial yeah for sure i think another thing to consider too is the fact that um com commercial real estate you know with the amount of layoffs that there actually have mm -hmm. been you know look at places like san francisco chicago you know stuff like that where businesses are kind of leaving those areas they're having to lay off people are working from home so there's all this commercial real estate as well, which could also have a massive impact on the economy because now you, now there's a, you don't really need to hire construction workers to put up more buildings. Right. So that also impacts. And then, you know, all the people associated, associated with the property management, et cetera. So there's a huge cascading effect that I think we'll also see from the commercial real estate yeah, bust as well. I think so. And an interesting factor I was reading about and people were trying to um, kind of draw parallels between this current market rally tech mini tech bubble whatever it is and then um in the 2000 the original internet bubble is that we're currently in like in the first stages of like an ai bubble so everyone's you know super hypey and i think the ai bubble has actually helped spur on the stock market because basically when chat gpt and all that came out in december we've rallied since then right because every business is like look we're gonna be laying off all these workers we're bringing in ai our bottom line is going to be increased with all these new technologies we're cutting costs we're increasing profits ai is now being integrated into every business and creating all these new opportunities. And I think that has helped a lot of this tech sector run. But what happens in when, when any new technology comes out is there's always like the, the, uh, the initial like hype bubble where everyone's yeah. like, Oh, AI will change the world or internet will change the world. And then there's a realization. Well, Not yet. one, it's going to take a long time. Yeah. And two, there's a bunch of bullshit out there and it's all going to go to zero except for maybe 5% of companies. Yeah. Right. So when that, we may starting to be entered that part of it where the, the initial hypey bubble is like, Oh, well, it's not going to happen overnight. Once that comes down, that might also coincide with the realization of the stock market, the tech bubble that we're kind of in right now. It's like, well, maybe this is all a bit of smoke and mirrors kind of hopping on the back of the AI as well. And they drew a parallel from the charts of 2000 and the AI bubble, and it's, it's so similar. It's very, right. very similar in terms of the performance of AI-based companies, stock yep. markets, and the, and the internet companies. So it's another parallel, which seems like we're heading towards that, that crash. But the companies that are doing it correctly, like there will be those, like the 5 to 10%, they will actually be able to save a ton of money on their costs and, and make things more efficient. So their bottom line could actually be a lot better. Oh, no and doubt. the stock market, the, those stocks could perform better than others. Yeah, for sure. So we're also seeing, what are we seeing in the crypto space? What I saw recently was the fact that we s we're seeing the 
the lowest amount of new crypto companies being started than ever uh, on a monthly basis. It's virtually city and zero. Mm. So that, a, that is a good thing. That's a good thing. Because in my opinion, I, I made a tweet about this was the fact that like, look, there's back. So this whole like uh, path to altcoin season, you know, I thought it was a little bit, I started to look into it. I'm like, all right, when, when were the, ta- when in the past did all coins really run? They ran in 2017 and they ran again in 2020. 2017 was the ICO uh, boom. That's when all these coins started, most of the coins started to come out. And, you know, these initial coin offerings, people are pi- piling in, et cetera, right? Then again, 2020, we had the massive stimulus package that was pumped out. You know, the U.S. pumped in like $5 trillion. The whole global economy was pump- pumped out money to their, to their citizens, right? They're sitting at home doing nothing, so they started to pour money into all these altcoins. Right. What, what's end, end up happening now is now we have like 20,000 tokens on the market, when in the past there might have only been 500 with a lot of liquidity. Now we've got 20,000, and there's not really a ton of liquidity going on right now. Yeah. So the fact that a lot of these tokens are hopefully going to start dying off, w- it could be a good thing for the legit projects that are really building. I think people will start to figure that out and be like, look, this is a garbage project. This is a good one. This is worth investing in, right? So I certainly hope so. A lot of the cream, the cream should rise to the top with, you know, maybe the top 100 that are just going to be entering. And now have a good team, solid backing, all these things, right? So Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, it's been a very interesting few weeks in crypto. Obviously, everyone knows about the BlackRock plus Fidelity plus all these other massive hedge funds registering for their ETFs, right? The spot, the Bitcoin spot ETFs. And this is huge news. It's insane and predictable, predictably insane to see the 180 that all those companies have done over the past six years. You know, you have the one article from Larry Fink, the BlackRock guy saying, Bitcoin is just an indexing of black market scams and money laundering. And then six years later, he's, he just went on the news saying, Bitcoin is digi- digital gold, tokenization of real world assets, BlackRock's been talking about. So they're all going full into crypto, full into Bitcoin. And, you know, from a, from a crypto head's point of view, this is exactly what we want to see. That in combination with incoming regulations, we see the regulators starting to come down. The kit. They're coming down on Binance. They're coming down on Coinbase. They're coming down on any unregulated exchanges, all sorts of unregulated activity. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, fucking bullshit, blah, blah, blah. But that's what we need. Yeah, we need We it. need the regulators to come out and get rid of all the bullshit. And we're seeing that slowly. And at the same time, as the regulations are slowly coming in, we're slowly seeing the big money make their moves to come in. It's all happening at the same pace. Right. Like, these, they're all working together, right? Yeah, it's all, all happening working. together. Yeah. This is good news for the crypto market long term, 100%. There's no way that all Bitcoin and all these altcoins are going to go up if we don't have a fresh injection of billion-dollar hedge fund liquidity all over the place. We need it because the retailers don't have money. Yeah. You know, you know a lot of 50% broke. We, everybody's broke. Like, they, got, they have high mortgage payments. The cost of food is still super expensive. Like, inflation is bullshit because, like, everything goes up and then they just measure it from the previous year. It's like, mm-hmm. well, it's only up 2% this year. It's like, yeah, well... But over the past five years, it's up like 100%. Yeah. It's just only up 2% from last year. For sure. It's kind of bullshit that way. And I mean, you know, you're looking at, I'm sure a lot of people have been affected by, you know, Binance basically leaving America, Coinbase getting regulated. A lot of the top exchanges have left North America. You know, I think Bybit, OKX, they're all leaving or uh, forcing people to KYC. And that's one of the reasons that we chose to partner up with BitGet, right? Like we've moved, we had to, we had to get out of Binance because we live in Canada. They're leaving, I think, next month. So we transferred all of our stuff. We're over to BitGet. I mean, we did an episode about how we think BitGet's the best exchange. If you want to check it out, there is a referral link in our description, which gets you a bunch of bonus stuff. But yeah, I think it, you have to be more selective about the platforms you're putting your money on in crypto because you want to get with the ones that are regulated, they know what they're doing, and there's no risk of the assets being frozen and stuff. And the fact that they are pushing a, a bunch of these exchanges out of America is also hurting the liquidity aspect as well. It's making it a lot more challenging for the everyday user to actually get involved in the space and gamble, if you will, on the tokens that they want to gamble on. Yeah. So that's another uh, aspect of things. We got to keep watching. Like, how is that going to happen? Is Coinbase going to end up being the leader in the space? All the all the filings for the Bitcoin ETFs have, have labeled uh, Coinbase as their surveillance yep. exchange that they're going to be using. For sure. Or are they going to... Like what? I don't know. What is the other way to get money into the crypto space in the U.S.? It's going to be through these hedge funds, these spot ETFs, and all That's that kind it, of stuff. Yeah, right? the, the regulated way, like yeah. the, the way that money flows into big money flows into stocks and stuff. ETFs. It's all ETFs, man. It's, that's yeah. what you need. I think I saw something. So there was a the, a case on study on gold when they eventually put gold as a gold trust on the stock exchange. Yep, it, it grew by five hundred percent post launch. Massive. 
So we would see billions of dollars flow into the space. <clears throat> I'm wondering if we see, I'm wondering if it's timed up just in time for the Bitcoin halving. Right. So we'll start to see that, you know, prices bleed out again, slowly, slowly, Is it slowly. Mid 24? Uh, mid 2024. Yeah. I think, yes. Yeah. Mid uh, April, May of 2024. Okay, yeah. So I'm wondering if that's when we start to see the ETFs get approved right before that moment in time. Mm. Everybody can step in right before the having. Interesting. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of interesting things in the horizon. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it is the middle of the summer here. This is a notoriously slow part of time for the markets, lower levels of liquidity, both in the stock market and crypto market. Don't expect any insane moves, barring some unexpected piece of news that's going to happen. But these are the times where you start to need, need to be reading the markets reading those headlines, seeing whether people are starting to flip bullish or flip bearish or whatever, because you always want to be contrarian, right? Yeah. But I think, look, my overarching, I think our overarching um, look at the market right now is you are starting to see those signs of a recession and more importantly, a end of this bear market rally start to creep in. But I think we do have more time. So yeah, I'm certainly not telling anyone. I'm not personally, I haven't placed a short in a very long time. I'm still continuing with mostly long positions in and out of all these these altcoins, Bitcoin, you know, we're always looking for more altcoin gems. There's always narratives to find, even yeah. if it is the summer. Um, but I don't think doomsday is quite here yet, even though you're probably going to start to hear people talk about it. So I do think the warning signs are there, like we talked about. You know, the fact that G GDP is slowing down, unemployment is rising. We're seeing consumer spending kind of level off. Mm. So we're seeing that. We are also seeing the fact that the Fed will be looking to either pause or pivot at some point next year, I think it'll be next year, we'll see a pivot, at which point we'll see that crash. Yep. I'm hoping it all happens in the first quarter, right before the Bitcoin halving, so we can gobble up a bunch of cheap coins, yeah. cheap Bitcoin, right before the next halving, where we, we see those exponential gains. Like a Q, Q1 2024 crash, and then real new bull market starts, Bitcoin halving, spot ETFs approved. Yeah. Like, and off we go, baby. Like, like late 2024, yeah. when they have to inject liquidity back into the markets again. Uh, like that's when I see it all coming together into one neat little tidy one, package. One beautiful explosion. Yeah. I like so, it. We're almost there. We're almost there, folks. We're yeah, almost yeah. there. All you got to do is stay tuned. Make sure to like and subscribe if you want more of this content. We always keep you up to date, whatever's happening. And tune to the next episode. That one is going to be a banger. All views expressed by speakers on the Bean Pod are solely their opinions. You should not treat any opinion expressed on the Bean Pod as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a specific strategy, but only as an expression of their opinion. This podcast is for informational purposes only.